Christian life uh, from 1908 to 1927. And in that time, Henry Ford quite adamantly didn't want to introduce any new cars. He felt quite sure that the Model T was enough. And anyway, even though the chassis was the same, you could have different types of bodies. The body that our car is wearing today is a touring body, more of a family car. Chris Barker, by the way, who's driving this car, is driving it very competently. I suggest, I wouldn't ask him to, but he could probably drive them in his sleep because he has one, and he drives it quite often, and sometimes he'll drive it to work here at the museum. Now, the peak year of production for the Model T was in 1923, when a staggering 1,817,891 cars were built. Now, that's just in one year. And at the peak of the cars' production, they were turning out a complete Model T about every four minutes. Now, Henry Ford is often credited as being the father of the production line method of building things, but that's not strictly true. He refined production line method of building motor cars, but he did not the production line uh, building or dismantling of things. And also, one of the misconceptions uh, about Henry Ford is that he was the first person to mass produce cars, but in fact, strictly speaking, he wasn't. Now, that, that, this is just showing off much behind you, Chris. <laughs> now, Chris, can I just ask you to stop a moment? Could you explain to our audience, just explain to our audience what you're doing, Chris? The left pedal makes it go forward, the middle pedal makes it go backward, and the right pedal slows it down. <laughs> well, I hope you all understood that. As I said, Chris could probably drive this in his sleep. They are very complicated cars to drive. Caroline here, my colleague, drove one the other day. They take a lot of getting used to, but once you get used to them, they're fairly easy. Carry on, please, Richard. And so, as I was saying, Henry Ford wasn't the first person to mass-produce motor cars in any significant numbers. No, that was actually Oldsmobile. Uh, in the museum, you may have seen a curved dash Oldsmobile. Ransom Olds, the chap who gave us the Oldsmobile, actually mass-produced cars before Henry Ford. What a lot of you may not know is that the Model T was produced around the world, not just in Detroit, in America, but in a number of countries and in no particular order, starting with Great Britain. Did you know that the Model T Ford was made in Great Britain? 300,000 were made in this country. Also in Ireland, France, Belgium, Germany, Denmark, Italy, Spain, Brazil, Argentina and even Japan. Really a global phenomenon, and it has to be said that this car certainly put the world on wheels. Another piece of misinformation about the uh, Model T Ford is the fact that it was only available in the colour black. Well, that's true, but only of uh, the dates uh, 1914 to 1926. On either side of those dates, you could have had your Model T in different colours. The reason for this was when the cars got into serious um, high volume production, they only uh, were produced in black because the black Japan enamel was the fastest drying paint, so they could get more cars off the production line. And Henry Ford died in 1947, folks, but what a legacy he's left us. Now, talking about legacies, then Richard, who is following in the nice little MG M type midget. Thank you, Chris. And it also runs a straightforward engine. This is a very small engine, though. It's actually derived from the uh, Morris Minor engine at the time, and it gives us uh, 847 cc's and a nice little 20 brake horsepower, which, if you remember, is the same as the Model T Ford, and a top speed of about 65 miles an hour. Now, that's not really going to set anyone's wear wrong by, but if you can imagine a car as that small, and your bottom being relatively close to the road, it certainly feels like you're going a lot faster. Now, MG probably is one of the most famous names, uh, manufacturers of sports cars. MG wouldn't exist today if it wasn't for the work of a man called Cecil Kimber. 
Cecil Kimber was actually working for Morris Garages uh, in the early 1920s and very quickly he saw that the Morris cars could do with slightly more interesting bodies. And so with the permission of uh, Morris, he started changing the bodies and then looking at the engines and seeing if he could produce a sportier car. Cecil Kimber was the sales manager at uh, Morris at the time, but very quickly Morris invested in his efforts and MG was born. MG stands for Morris Garages, by the way. The first engine was produced in 1929 and the production run lasted until 1932. It's a very popular car and sales were very strong. So as I say, it's not very fast, but it's cheap, relatively cheap to buy back in the day. And reasonably fast, practical, and more than anything, it's fun. And those are all virtues that MG became very well known for, including the MG range, for example, sorry, the, the MGB and the BGT. The MG brand is still in existence today, albeit in foreign hands. I don't know what Cecil Kimber would have made of that. The rather tragic footnote to the story of Mr. Kimber and MG, though, in 1945, he was killed in a freak rail accident just outside King's Cross in London and was one of two people who were killed in a train collision. He certainly left, just like Mr Ford before him, he left his mark on motoring history. Now the next two cars are something else altogether, but they're not necessarily what you might think they are. These are not the real deal, these are replica cars. I have no problem with that. We have a number of replicas in our collection. We're a charitable trust, we certainly don't have the millions that we would need to be able to acquire these cars in their original state. So we have a D-Type Jaguar replica driving around now, and hopefully we're going to have a Ford GT40 that's just starting up now. Tell you a little bit about the Jaguar then. Probably one of the most famous racing cars of all time. Incredibly advanced in its day. Very successful car. This is based on a 1998 car, the Jaguar D-Type replica. It has a lot of Jaguar uh, running gear in it. Runs a straight six engine, the very famous, renowned, reliable XK engine that was designed or conceptualized in the Second World War and was first seen in Jaguar's XJ120 in the late 40s. That engine went on to be produced until 1992 in a very long range of vehicles. And this one appears today in 3.4 litre form. It's giving about 245 brake horsepower and is good for around 175 miles an hour. Now a lot of motor car manufacturers are aware of the fact that competing in motor racing is a very good way of advertising your product and William Lyons of Jaguar uh, was, was not ignorant of this fact. Jaguar had already raced with the quite successful C-Type, but the D-Type was something else altogether. Now this was the uh, result of uh, the work of William uh, Sayer. William Sayer was a very clever man at Jaguar, and he was the first person to introduce um, the laws and technology behind aircraft design into car manufacture. If you have a very close look at the D-Type, it has a very slippery body, very good for cutting through air, in other words, very aerodynamic. It also has a light alloy body as well, which, which makes it even faster. Now, back in the day, uh, D-Types were tested up to around 200 miles an hour on the Malcolm Strait at Le Mans. Now, the car was very successful at Le Mans, but the first victory of the car was a very hollow one. In the mid-1950s, there was a, a, a horrific crash at Le Mans, where nearly 100 people died when a Mercedes lost control and crashed into uh, the spectator um, viewing area. The car broke apart, and also the, the, the engine was made of very light... Uh, alloy material and when water was sprayed on it to put the fire out it exploded because of their chemical reaction. Now Mercedes out of deference to the situation um, respectfully withdrew from the race but Jaguar controversially 
continued, won the race uh, and didn't make them very many friends in the process. Very controversial victory. Their yeah, next so victory in 1956 yeah. gave them first and fourth <laughs> place at Le Mans. And then the next year, in 1957, a spectacular first, second, third and fourth placing. Absolutely incredible. But by then the car was already considered out of date. It was old fashioned despite its looks. And Jaguar retired from motor racing at that time, only to come back to motor racing some years later on. One interesting footnote to the story of the D-Type is that there were a few bodies left when Jaguar pulled out of racing and it converted them into road-going cars. And that car became the XKSS. Now we have a replica of one of those in the museum uh, in our supercar century. Sorry, no, it's in our red room display. Um, so go and have a look at that car later on. It is pretty much the same as the D-Type, but it doesn't have the fin. It has an extra door and some very rudimentary weather protection, including windscreen wipers and a roof covering as well. So let's move on to the GT40 then, one of my all-time favourite cars. I think it looks absolutely stunning. And there's a wonderful story behind it. Now, this car again, a replica, is based on a 1994 car. Give us some beans, David. Right, so it's Bill driving. That sounds absolutely yeah. wonderful. And that's not the biggest engine a GT40 can have. Looks like he might be out of the brake lights, actually, there. Wouldn't pass its MOT. So for the V8 engine and the capacity of that car is just under 5 litres, getting about 200 brake horsepower, and the top speed would be around 150 miles an hour. Now, at the time, in the early 60s, Ford, just like Jaguar, and this is Henry um, Ford II, the grandson of Henry Ford, decided that Ford should compete in motor racing to promote its product. They made advances to Ferrari, which had financial difficulties at the time. So they had a meeting with Enzo, who very cordially invited them over to Italy. They talked, and he made all the right noises, and even suggested that he might be willing to sell Ferrari to Ford. But when he became aware that Ford essentially wanted the Ferrari Scuderia, which is Ferrari's racing team, and so flatly said no. He absolutely didn't want to sell a racing team because racing was what Ferrari was all about. So Ford turned around and decided that, okay, if they couldn't buy Ferrari, they would build something that would hopefully beat it. And so the GT40 was born. Now, you may not know that the origins of the GT40 actually start in Great Britain. There was a car manufacturer at the time called Lola, who was producing a car that got the attention of Ford and was what they based the GT40 on. The first GT40 appeared in 1964. It wasn't successful straight away, so no, they had to work on the car. And they also involved the... Uh, they asked for the cooperation and, and experience of a chap whose name you might be familiar with, Carol Shelby. Yeah. We talk about Mr. Shelby a lot at the museum because he has an involvement with quite a few of our cars, including the wonderful AC Cobra you may have seen in our reception area. And so he was involved uh, with the GT40 and also one of the other cars behind me that I'll be talking about later on. I wonder if anyone knows why it's called the GT40. Well, I'll tell you, the original design specification of the car from Ford dictated that it should be 40 inches high. And when the cars go back into our front car park afterwards, stand next to it and you'll see just how low that car is. The cars that became successful at Le Mans had bigger engines and they went up to 7 litres and on a straight could achieve speeds of up to 200 miles an hour. And remarkably, Ford certainly had a very successful car with a GT40. It won four years in a row. 1966, 67, 68, and 69, which is an absolutely remarkable uh, success for the car. So Ford really did prove that they didn't need to buy Ferrari to compete with it. They built it to their own car, and boy, did they win. Right, we're going to two wheels now. We're in case of... 
which there they are. We have a Dodge Viper, RT10, and a 19, 19, sorry, 1996, 1966 Ford Mustang. Now the Viper, I've driven that car a lot. It's a jolly nice car. It can be very tame, but also can get angry if you don't treat it carefully. It's <laughs> an early Viper, it's a 1995 car. It has a V10 engine. And get this, 8 litres under the bonnet, giving about 400 brake horsepower. And that will take you up quite comfort comfortably to about 162 miles an hour. As I say, that's quite an early car, the later cars are even 